So if you're a guitar player, and I assume you are if you're here, you at some point, either in the past, the present, or the future, have been or will be asked to take a solo. And initially, if it's the first time you've done so, it can be terrifying, and it can be even a question of where do I even start with that? So the way to get started, and this is an endless topic, so don't think you're gonna figure it out in one lesson, or a year even, the way you're going to start is getting some building blocks together so that you can actually start coming up with something musical when it's time to take a lead. We're going to start with talking about pentatonic scales. Pentatonic scales are, as the name implies, scales made up of five notes. And for a lot of guitar players, that's where they derive a lot of their soloing. So you can see it as a starting place or you can see it as an end in and of itself. So for example one, we're going to go through an A minor pentatonic. So the notes of an A minor pentatonic are A, C, D, E, and G. And then we'll, we'll, we'll resolve it to A, the tonic. So again. We're also going to look at its relative major, which is a C major pentatonic. Very quickly on relative keys, it's just a quick way of saying that they share the same notes. So it, even if you're starting in a different place, even if you're interpreting the tonic as a different note, they, they share the same notes. So C major and A minor are relative keys. So C major, we're gonna start on a C. So this is example 1B. It's the same notes, but we're just gonna be starting on C, D, E, G, A, resolving to C. In example two, and in the following examples, two through seven, we're just going to take these notes and we're going to play them in different positions up and down the neck. So you'll see that they actually fall into finger patterns that ultimately you can move to play in different keys. So we're going to start at the lowest position on the neck for example two. Example three, we're going to be starting on G of the pentatonic scale, of the A minor pentatonic or C major. And here's how it falls under the fingers. For the purposes of not doing too much in one lesson, I'm just showing you in one direction. But I recommend when you practice these, you practice climbing, descending, and trying to really internalize them and different directions. So example four shows the full scale that we started with in example 1A. So this is example four, A minor, C major, pentatonic, however you want to see it, starting at the fifth fret. It's worth noting that this is a really, really common way to play this this particular pentatonic scale. Um, I, I think largely because you have your root as the lowest note and it just falls under the fingers really nicely. So a lot of leads that you'll learn from other people will be out of this particular pentatonic form. That, that's not to say that you shouldn't learn the other ones too, but this one you definitely want to learn. Example five, we're now going to be starting with our first, uh, our second finger actually on the C. This is example six, just continuing to climb upwards. Example seven is going to be the counterpart an octave up from the, the position we played down here with the open strings. But again, because open strings and fretted notes, just at least for me, I interpret them differently. I feel them differently. I, I, even though I know intellectually these these are the same notes. I think it's good to still practice all of the shapes that, that involve fretted notes as well. So this is our last one of the pentatonic sequence here. Um, this is example seven. So to take these things now and get started, I recommend doing two different things. One is the just necessary mechanical, meaning just going through and getting these different shapes and patterns under your fingers, but also try to get them in your brain. Don't, don't just remember them as 
just a sequence of where your fingers are placed, but try to actually have a sense as you're learning them of, okay, this is this note. And then that way you'll, it'll just be more meaningful. You'll be able to use things better. But then the other part that I think is really important not to overlook is start immediately trying to come up with something musical. Don't overestimate how musical it needs to be because initially it's very easy to have a lot of judgments. And I don't think the brain works so well when you're constantly judging what you're playing. So what I recommend is biting off very small chunks and trying to do as much as you can with a, lim uh, with a limited amount. And, and as you're doing so, it's better to just get very comfortable with something limited and then start adding to it. So for example, you know, don't just play the notes of the pentatonic scale. Do that, yes, and, and get them under your fingers. But then what I recommend is taking two strings, one string if you want, meaning two notes, and start trying to create something that sounds like music. So instead of just going, I'm using the B and the high E strings here, start trying to add variety, add nuance, add, you know, so instead of try, it's, not, it's nothing brilliant, but the point is, is you're starting to think about creating something that isn't just a mechanical exercise. And then as you get familiar, say with these four notes, give yourself one or two more. Now we're gonna move on to diatonic scales. So these are scales that have seven scale degrees. And they're useful for various types of music. They're the building blocks of music. One of the things that people, I think, often do initially, and, and I did the same thing too, and that's why I've come to believe that the way that I'm about to show you is maybe more beneficial. Initially, a lot of times people get all of the modes at once, you know, which I think tends to be information overload. And also, at least, it isn't always as useful. Chances are you're going to be using a couple of the modes a lot more than others. Now, that may differ for you based on the style of music that you play, but I'm going to bet that the major and minor modes are going to be the most useful. They certainly are for me. It doesn't mean that Phrygian and Dorian and Lydian don't have their uni unique and characteristic sounds, and they're super cool in different ways, but I think the most useful are probably going to be major and minor, so that's what we're going to be focusing on. So for uh, example eight, we're going to start with the A minor, or the A minor diatonic scale, starting on A. You'll, you'll notice that this is actually where the pentatonics that we uh, we're just talking about that, it, that it's basically the same notes. We're now just adding two more. So here's example 8a. In example 8b, we're going to look at the relative major, which is C major. Again, all of the same notes, just starting on C and interpreting C as our tonic. Now in the following examples, we're going to do the same thing, which is just connecting all of the notes in the A minor or C major scale up the neck. This is example nine. And then you can play it down as well. For the purposes of time, we'll just go in one direction. This is example 10, starting on the F. so forth. This is example 11, starting on the G. And so forth. So this is example 12, and it's the extension of example 8A and 8B. This is example 13, etc. This is example 14. And so on. This is example 15. And so forth. 
In example 16, we're using the same notes an octave up that we did in example 9. But now that we have the fretted notes, we're going to really see the pattern that then you can use and apply to other keys. So this is example 16. <laughs> So, on. so now we're going to talk about a whole other soloing approach. And this is one that, at least initially, might seem a little bit more complex, but is also a really great approach. And it's something that a lot of you know, jazz musicians use. And, and actually, I feel like anybody who's been playing a long time whose ear is really developed, they do it either consciously or unconsciously. And at least the way I see it is that you can be playing out of the correct scale, but still be getting dissonances with the underlying harmony. So for example, if you're playing over the chord A, uh, and you're in the key of A major, and you're playing an A major scale, you can be hitting notes that are still dissonant with the underlying chord. So for example, the, uh, the A major chord has the notes A, C sharp, and E, the root, the third, and the fifth of the A major scale. You could play something like a D that's technically the fourth of an A major scale, which should be totally fine, but listen to how that sounds. Well, let me see if I can do this here, because I, I want to keep the third here, basically. I don't know if you can hear that. You can hear that there's this clash, because it's basically these two notes playing at the same time. And, and then conversely, if you were playing D major and hitting that, that C sharp, I mean, that's actually when it's voiced like that, you end up getting a, you know, a D major 7, which you know, for a lot of ears is perfectly fine. But the point is, is that it doesn't, always, it doesn't always work as well, and it's something that doesn't necessarily enhance the harmony. I should note that any really great improviser can make any note work, chromatic notes, wrong notes, whatever, they can make them all work. But since we're starting at the beginning, let's start with the most fundamental approach, and that's going to be focusing on chord tones as the chords happen underneath us. So something you're going to be hearing in these is we've recorded just a very simple backing track so that you'll be able to play these examples over the chord changes, or in some cases, the single chord that you're going to be referencing. This is example 17. One, two, three, four. So in example 17, we just played the notes of the arpeggio, so you can hear how they imply the chord changes and enhance the chord changes, because they are the chord changes. In example 18, though, we're going to try to start playing around with chord tones, adding some rhythmic variety, adding a little bit of melodic contour, and adding in a couple of cases a non-chord tone, but placed on a weak beat so that they're not heard as conflicting with the chord, but more connecting the melody line to itself. This is example 18. One, two, three, four. So in this last series of approaches to soloing, a very handy one you can use is theme and variations. That can be really effective because it keeps a solo more comprehensible to you. I think every player at some point or another has played themselves into a corner where they're like, I don't even know where I'm going with this. If you stick with a theme that's something that's simple and comprehensible and easy to remember even when you're kind of in the middle of taking a solo, it can help make for more coherent solos and it can make for more musically interesting and impactful solos. So what we're going to start with in example 19 is we're going to take just that first measure of example 18 and then show ways that you can vary it. So just to review, this is, this is example 19. One, two, three, four. So we're going to see that as just sort of this little melodic motif that then we can use to manipulate and embellish it in different ways so that you still, so it's still kind of recognizable as, as itself, but that it, we now get more mileage out of a simple idea. In examples 20A through 20C, we're going to add a couple of notes to embellish it. This is example 20A. One, two, three, four. 
This is 20 B. One, two, three, four. This is 20 C. One, two, three, four. In examples 21A through C, we're going to talk about fragmentation, which is taking an even smaller part of the motif and extending it. So we're actually just going to take like the first half of our, of our motif. So this is exercise 21A. One, two, three, four. This is 21B. One, two, three, four. This is 21C. One, two, three, four. In our last three examples, we're going to try different approaches to changing the rhythm. So taking our same motif and then playing with different ways of interpreting it rhythmically. This is 22A. One, two, three, four. This is 22B. One, two, three, four. This is 22C. One, two, three, four. So the last bit of advice I have is to consider doing something that I think most people find incredibly uncomfortable at first. I know I, I did and I still do. And it's the idea of really trying to concentrate on hearing something in your mind first and then applying it to the guitar. That's a very pure way to write and it can also encourage you to be creative. So a way a lot of people are encouraged to do that and um, to do it and the way I'm encouraging you to is try singing something first. Try, try listening either in your mind or through uh, whatever sound system you're using to backing tracks um, and just hearing a melody. Try singing the melody, try making it really memorable so it's something you'll be able to find easily on your guitar. If you're uncomfortable doing that, you can even use um, some way of like recording a voice memo or something like that so that then you have that reference and you can go back and you can learn it. Like I said, it can be uncomfortable, but it can be so helpful as well. So the thing to take away from all of this, I know it's a lot of information, is this is an endless subject, truly endless. You could work your rest, the rest of your life on it, and that's part of the beauty of music, is that it is endless, and we can always find new challenges. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't start off with tackling something, even if it's endless. we got to start somewhere. So good luck with it. Hope you can find something musical, and always try to write. <laughs>